you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask that you turn to the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth chapter 2 is where we'll take our text this morning and uh, continue to ask for prayer as your pastor and as we try to lead the church. Ruth chapter 2 in the first verse, the Bible says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field, and I and glean ears of corn after him, and whose sight I shall find, find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her half was to lie on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And the reapers answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves so that they came and have continued even from the morning unto now, and she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go, not glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Then Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shewed me all that thou hast done for thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and, thou, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and are come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. And the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, unto whose wings thou art come to trust. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word, Lord. We thank you for what it provides us from day to day in an unstable time. Lord, you stabilize us with your word and we praise you for that. God, this morning we pray that you would open your word to us, Lord, that we might understand the truth that's held in this blessed book that's before us. Uh, anoint the word that it may find lodging place in the hearts of the believers here, and that you might strip the, uh, the hide from the unbeliever's heart this morning, and that you might open it, make it tender to your grace, and save them by your marvelous and wonderful grace. We be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning uh, really from the 12th verse, and that is under the wings of the Lord. Now, uh, the position of being under the wings of, of the Lord God is a, a position of safety. It's a position of protection. It's a position of provision, but it's not a position that is easy to be in. And it's not a position and a position that's easy to get to. It's not something you're born into, but rather a, a, a position that you must work to get to. Now, I'm not talking about work salvation, but I am talking abiding near, about abiding near unto the Lord is not an easy thing to accomplish. Now, everybody knows the story of Naomi and Ruth, and Naomi being a Jewish uh, and, you know, if you study the whole life of Naomi, I don't think Naomi was too much, to be honest. I don't think she was a, a very good example to non-believers. I think she liked to rule the roost. 
down at the house and she talked uh, her husband into doing some things that ought not to be done. You know what? The biggest, the biggest lesson you can learn from Ruth 1 is when things are dry, if God don't say move, you sit still. You know what? You may have to go through just a little bit of drought from time to time. And you know what? What it'll make you at the, at the end of it, you'll be a little bit more appreciative of cold water after you, after you sustain a drought or two. And so we find this woman probably not the best example. Naomi uh, was the only, uh, her and Elimelech were the Jews that she, that this woman knew. And she decides to come back with her. And we'll see that she's probably a stronger believer than Naomi herself. And Naomi had a, kin, a kinsman of, a, of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. Now, I want you to notice two things about that that we can apply to our, our daily lives. It says that it was her family, but then it said it was Elimelech's kindred. You know what? When a man and a woman come together, there's two families. And the best way a young couple can get started is appreciating both sides of a house and not turn one against the other and, and get into a big fight. Because if you follow the biblical example, now you're in, you're in. And what is theirs is theirs, and what yours is yours. Is, is. And, and so you're one big family, and the best thing to do is approach it that way. So really, this kinsman was not Naomi's biologically, but rather it was Elimelech's. I, I believe Elimelech probably had a very spiritual, had a, a better spiritual situation than maybe Naomi did growing up. Naomi had a kinsman uh, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, the family of the family of Elim Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi. Now, if you remember when they left, Naomi tried to talk Ruth into staying in a heathen nation. You know, what a horrible example. What, what an ungodly situation. And we know Orpah took her up on it. And Orpah, loving the gods of the land, she stayed with them. And we find the Moabitess begging to go back with Naomi. In a way, that's a shame, isn't it? That, that you know what? It should be Naomi's responsibility to beg them, not the other way around. And uh, get out of that place. Leave the heathen land. And so we find now very consistent with her character, we find that Ruth, not Naomi, is the one ready to get out and do something and work and do something in the land of God's people. You know what? I don't care what you do this morning. If you don't do anything but sow a hymn in the curtains that belong to the church, you know what? You need to get up and do something for God's people this morning. Yeah. That, that, I mean, I don't care what you say you can't do, focus on what you can do. Right. Focus on your abilities that are present. And, and we, and, but rather we find the opposite, that, that Ruth, the Moabitess, is the one that's initiating this thing. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean the ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. Now, I want you to notice two things there. First of all, she was willing to glean. You know what we want in the modern day is just big, big stuff. Gleaning is difficult, and the harvest is minute. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, today we have huge combines and threshers, and it's very easy to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get a harvest in. But even the sharpest, most pristine combine leaves a little bit behind. That, that's what Naomi, that's what Ruth's harvest was. Now, we want to be the combine, don't we? We want to look good and we want things. You know what? Them combines in modern day, they have air conditioning and everything. I mean, it, it's like driving a car around the field. And, 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 and can you imagine going from that to picking up the little pieces that are left when the combine's done? You know what? That may be your ministry. You know what you need to do, beloved? 
You need to get out there, and if all you're going to do is pick up the kernels, you get the best ones, and you get more than everybody else, and you go after them. But that is not the modern-day thought of mankind. I don't think it's ever been the thought of mankind, because we want bigger and better and more. You know what that is? That's the nature of the flesh. Right. Nothing more. And, and so we find then that Naomi took this unto herself, a very humble, a very difficult job, a very low-class job, and she said, yes, I'll do it. And then she predicts, she goes, I'm going to find grace in that man's eyes. Now, she was never anticipating being the wife of Boaz. She was expecting to be a servant. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the best I have to offer you this morning, you preacher boys, is you're going to be a servant. If you ever placed a pastorate, don't, uh, get too, don't get too good to mow the grass. Don't get too good to mop the floor. You know what I did this morning? Came in and set Joey down and went downstairs and filled up the drink box. Because you know what? We needed something cold to drink for lunch. I'm not too good to do that. I put more Diet Dr. Pepper than anything, but I did get it done. Uh, so we need uh, we need to be like that. Don't we? we need we need to be willing to do whatever's necessary. And, and so I think both uh, I think Ruth was of that nature, and, and she was willing to get the job done, and she wasn't prideful about it. Now notice in all her wisdom, all that Naomi had to say. Go, oh, my daughter. I mean, she was looking forward to cornbread that night, don't you? Uh, she didn't say, Naomi, you know what? I'm going to go help you do that. If you can do her, I can do her. Huh. She sat up in the house waiting for the corn to come home. Right? I've known a few like that, too, ain't you? And, and, and so we find, really, there's very two different types of people in, in, in these two women. And we find the worker among them is really Ruth the heathen. Verse 3, and she went and came and gleaned, uh, and gleaned in the field after the reaper, and her half or her chance, or, and there is no chance of God, so I love that word there, and her half was to lie on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. You know what? You're never where, you're never anywhere by happen chance. You're never at any place just by uh, just by coincidence. If you're there, it's by the grace and the mercy of God, and you're in that place because of God's goodness. And you know what? There has to be something useful in whatever place He puts you. Amen. And so the Lord God worked it out, and she ended up in the part that was a near kinsman. She ended up in the portion of the harvest, doing exact in the exact spot where God would have her to be. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. So the, uh, Boaz, being a rich and wealthy man, he had workers. He'd be like uh, having a farm here and having a farm over in Obine County, over in West Tennessee. And he came from over there to check up on the things here in Dover. And you know what? That that uh, that very trip to go home was planned and ordained of God. You know what I found? If God gives you an impulse to do something, it's you better get on it and do it. You think there's any happenstance that Boaz got the urge to run home for a few minutes? No, God had a plan for him. Only, the only thing Boaz had to contribute was he was obedient. He listened to what God had to say, ran home for a few days. And there he meets the meets Ruth the Moabitess woman. Uh, what a wonderful, glorious thing that God accomplished here. Two, two willing vessels, two obedient people under the will of God. Verse 5, Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reaper, Whose damsel is this? You ever wonder why he took note of Ruth? I believe it kind of explains in the next few scriptures, but I believe what it was, she was working. She was down, the corn probably already bent over and knocked over, and the reaper's done with it and just picking up little pieces, put them in her pouch. Now, I don't believe she was going, 
push is going to hurt. Just as hard as she can get. And you know why? It wasn't just that uh, her life depended on it and it did. It's because she, whatever she did, she was going to do right. Isn't that a wonderful thought this morning if we could capture that? If it was simply mo uh, mopping the basement floor, do it. Now, I heard my wife and my mother-in-law and I think Heather uh, complain about that basement floor about since we've been in this building. And he did. You know what? I've mopped the whole thing myself and got back here to going down and look back and it looked just like I started with. You know, it, look, it looks exactly the same that you started with. And you want to throw up your hands. You know what? Best thing I can do is keep my mouth shut, pick up the mop, and mop her again. Right? That, that's where we should be. Oh, I'm too good to do that. I'm the pastor. No, no. You know what? It wasn't too good for Christ to walk up that hill, was it? That's right. It wasn't too good for Christ to take that ungodly beating on my behalf. He is the very King of Kings and Lords of Lords. So if it's not good for too good for him, it can't be too good for me. And, and so we find then that this woman. I believe the reason Boaz took note of her, number one, she was not too good to do it, and number two, she did it aggressively. She did it with some zeal. She did it with some heartfelt interest, and that's what took note of her. Who is this? And the servants that were set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back from, with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Now, I want you to see that you're going to have discouragement. Now, I don't know if Ruth heard this conversation or not. Uh, she may have been too far out in the field, or she may have been so, I don't, I don't know. But I do know this. <laughs> you know how they looked at her? She was a Moabite. You know, you know how people, uh, you outside this country, you're going to be looked at in disdain too. That, that's why I encourage people to leave this country occasionally. It's because we think we've arrived. Uh, worst place I ever treated in my life was Paris, France. I wanted to say, you remember Normandy? Uh, I did. I couldn't say it to them if I wanted to because I didn't know how. But I wanted to. They, you know you know what they saw in me? An American. We, we need that sometime, don't we? Because we think we've arrived. We, we, we've been brainwashed for years to think, hey, there's no one like us. You know, that, 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 that's real familiar doctrine that comes from Rome. You know, they thought there was nothing like them, nothing like them too, and they brought down that they had about that much land left. Right? And, and, and so we find then that uh, despite all her efforts, well, she's just a Moabite. She just wanted people that came out of the heathen land. Naomi drug her back. She, uh, in man's eyes, there was no value to Ruth. You know what? In man's eyes, there's no value to you either. In man's values, there's no value here at New Testament Baptist Church. We're wasting our time. We're spinning our wheels. We could be doing something more productive. That was what the view of the Moabitess was. She's just a heathen. She's just an outsider. She doesn't belong here. But you know what? Even her position, she accepted gladly. Notice what verse uh, 7. And, she's, uh, and she, still the explanation from the servant, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves also. So she came and had, notice this, and it continued even from morning unto now, and that she tarried a little in the house. Now, I want you to notice that Naomi, not only was she aggressive with her work, she was faithful to her work. Um, how many people love when the dinner bell is? Now, personally, I have never worked in a factory. I've always thought it was interesting. Uh, I remember when I was in high school that they took a group of us out. Billy Lee took us a big group of us out over to the sewing factory. 
And back then it was still carpet. And we had to write a paper uh, on uh, what we saw and what we thought. And, uh, and that, that was the plan, advanced English class. And so I, I went and I, I thought it was very interesting. And there's this woman there, I don't know who she was. And she said, let me look at your hands. And I said, well, no. oh, you ain't made for this. So I, I was rejected and said, yeah, this, <laughs> this is not your thing. And, and seeing, seeing sewing factory work and stuff over the years, I don't think sewing was my thing either. But I want you to see those women went at it like nothing else. Before my sister became a nurse, Judy worked out there for years. And Judy was good. And she, Judy was never a dummy. You can say a thing a lot about Judy, but she was no dummy. And she would work super hard all week and take Friday afternoon. No, she'd turn her little tickets in at the end of the day and say, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, no dummy, is it? How did she do that? She went fast after it. And she did good quality work. Because see, if they, if they call it back and say, you know, Judy, you, these jeans ain't up to standard, you just got to do them over again, right? And, and, and so I believe Ruth was that same way. She paid attention to detail, but yet was going forward all the time as well. She was aggressive about her work. It wasn't too good for her. Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Do not glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here, fast by my maids. Now I want you to see God begins to advance her. And now what we would, what we would notice is a full-time job. She went off the, just let me give, get what I can. Now she was going to get a little flour every day. She was going to get a little corn every evening when she went to the house. She was working steady. You know what? Isn't it a wonderful thing when God begins to bless your ministry? Even if it's you're not a preacher, you're not a guy, you can't go out and preach the gospel, but whatever little bit you do, somebody says, you know what? It's something different about me. Tell me what's different. Why don't you get stressed like the rest of us? And you have the opportunity to, to tell the goodness of God. So we find that God begins to use her in a great, in a mighty way and uh, gives, her, give her, gives her steadiness in the difficult time she lives. Now notice verse 9, Let thine eyes be on the field that uh, they do reap, meaning the main harvesters, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? We find in the middle of that verse, and it would be easy to miss, that he also provides safety. Isn't it a wonderful thing that God provides safety for us? Now what that means, in it, and you wouldn't understand it because if you didn't know her nationality and the Jewish culture, she, she was very vulnerable out there. And she got knocked in the head as a non-Jew, you know that that wasn't even a crime. But they would have had no charge brought against them. But you know what? You could kill Gentiles. And it was A-OK. -okay. And so now she has safety that she never had before. You know what? If you're saved here this morning, you have safety that you can't even understand in this carnal worldly mind. No matter what comes against you, safe, stable, good, uh, things good to go. And so we see these blessings that, uh, that he, uh, Boaz begins to provide her time and time again. Then she says, and when thou, and then he says, and when thou art thirst, go into the vessels. Now she don't have to get what little bit she can. She gets to go right up to where the men are hauling the water in and get her a good drink whenever she needs it. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? She's went for essentially from a, a reject to work in the main line. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself unto the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me? I am a stranger. 
I am a Gentile. I am a non-Jew. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. How did this accomplish? Now, if you remember, when she headed out in verse 2, he said, uh, uh, she said, I want to find grace in his eyes. And when it happened, she's surprised. Have you ever prayed for something, and then when it's happened, you're blown away that it happened? <laughs> you know what that means? You don't have enough faith. <laughs> and the same thing for me. She says, you know what? He's going to give me grace. And get down there. And she's so surprised when grace comes through, she falls down on her face. Isn't it a wonderful thing? When, when, when something comes out of nothing, that, that's a glorious thing. Sometimes we wonder, listen, why did, why did I have to get down to my last dollar so God can get the glory? I can tell you fully why it has to, why it has to happen that way. And so she gives praise unto God. Verse 11, and Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shewed me all that has done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. Now, if you remember, Naomi wasn't the, wasn't the easiest person to be nice to. Remember, she tried to talk them into saying, You stay in the heathen land, I couldn't have you another husband if I tried. Can you imagine begging somebody to stay in sin? That's what Naomi was doing. You stay with the heathen. You stay with the wicked people, and I'm going back home. Man, you know, that, that, that's, but you know what? When we get out in the world and we act like the world, we look like the world, we present like the world, we're doing the same thing. That's the ministry of Naomi, is it not? And, 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 and so we find that she begs to... Uh, Stay with her. She provides for Naomi's needs. Naomi's not even trying to help out. And this gets around. This gets around other people. This is this is not normal. And I don't mean to go too forward on this, but all we can think about that this week. And uh, I've almost seen it across the board after fifty something years of living. Typically, a woman doesn't get along with her mother-in-law. And I don't know why that is. It's just how it is. And I've seen that pretty much across the board. Now, a man, Diane is my second mother, and now since mama's gone, I guess she's my mother. But it doesn't work the other way around. And, and, and you can look at it, and, and, and not only will you see that in the Bible, you will see it in life, too. And I can't explain that, but you know what? Ruth was different, wasn't she? She treated her mother-in-law like her mother. She didn't deserve it. Naomi was a piece of work. Right? You know who does things like that? People that are saved. People that are regenerate. People who are different. And, and, and so we find then, uh, uh, we find then that uh, <laughs> that reputation gets around town. And Boaz answered and she, and, and and Boaz answered and said unto her, It had been fully shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother in law since the death of thine husband, since the death, uh, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and are come into a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense or repay or give you grace. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel and under whose wings thou art come to trust. So living under the wings of the Almighty, what a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. Very difficult to do, but what a wonderful thing. I want to show you a New Testament example in the Lord close. Uh, the book of 2 Timothy. Second Timothy, we're going to go to chapter 4, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Second Timothy chapter 4, Paul's really final address to young Timothy. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, he makes Timothy responsible. Giving someone a charge is saying, this is what you're to do. This is, I, I, I'm giving this over and you must continue to do this. Also, I want you to see that he defines, he, he, he defines two different events. Who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Two groups of people, two judgments. And then he begins his decree. Preach the word. You know, you know what we're to do until the returning of the Lord Jesus Christ? Preach the word. It's good to pastor. It's good to be a good church member. But the thing we need to do is preach the word. Out there, out, out, outside the walls of this little chapel building, out somewhere. Uh, and you know what? You don't have to be a preacher to preach the word. Tell of his goodness and grace in the grocery line. Tell of his goodness and grace when you bump into somebody uh, along the way. You see a friend from high school and say hello to them. Tell them how good, good God's been for, to you for the last 35 years. I mean, Donna just went over. Uh, we, we graduated in 87, so we've been out 35 years. Is that crazy? But you know what? I'd like to see some of the people with you. So listen, let me, let me tell you how good God's been. Let, let me show you what it brought me through. And so we see, we see as, as Paul is nearing his very last days, he, he reiterates the Great Commission, preach the word, be instant or ready, in season, out of season. Listen, truth is out of season. It's been out of season for a long, long time. The truth that you cannot help yourself is not popular in the day which we live. With the truth that we can't have a rock concert and stamp the name of Jesus across the top of it and call it worship. Listen, that's not popular today, but it's the truth. Be faithful to that. Uh, uh, commit it unto God, to yourself and be near to it. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, a three-part ministry, and I don't have really time to get into that, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Uh, lies. Uh, something that's false. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. You know what? To, to complete that part of the ministry, what has to come? You can't endure afflictions if they're not there, right? So you know what? That, that's an indication to me that afflictions is just part of this life. Uh, afflictions are just difficulties that we're going to have to deal with. We're not going to circumvent them. We're not going to get past them. And you know what? They're to our benefit because if they didn't exist, you'd get comfortable here. It would get pretty pleasant in this place. And, and so he says, when they come, Timothy, all I can do is tell you to endure them, sit there and, and get through the situation, bear the pain, go through what's necessary, uh, and then you'll be better when you come out on the other side. Then he says in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered. Are you ready for that? You ready to die? Now I'm not talking spiritually. Are you ready to die? You know, I'm saved. I'm going to glory. If stuff up here doesn't go well, just remember this. <laughs> it's been a good trip. But I've got two over there, three really. I'm going to leave Donna out. You know what? I'm responsible for them. Pretty scary, ain't it? 
you don't believe that, why do you think the Lord Jesus Christ said, and looked, and looked at John and said, uh, she's yours now. You be sure that Mary's needs are met. Pretty, pretty difficult stuff, ain't it? Are you ready? His departure time was getting near. And he said, listen, listen, no, I'm ready. I'm anxious. How do you suppose he came to that mentally and being comfortable enough to say that? I believe Paul was abiding under his wings, don't you? Listen, that's a rough storm. He, listen, he didn't die in a pleasant way. If history is correct, man, off with his head, right? One thing no pleasant way to die. He said, oh, well, it only lasts a second. Well, when you chomp up there, let me know. If it's so easy and wonderful, let's see you on the block. You see what I'm saying? How are you going to get there? Well, he's talking, and I was showing Eric yesterday out of his house, and this is probably foolishness because Donna's what I don't think Donna got the vaccine. But well, supposedly, people with a vaccine, you can put a quarter on the injection site and it will stick. And mine did. <laughs> And Eric, you could tell Eric didn't believe me. I was oh, sure. nice trying to find the injection sign. First couple times I couldn't find it. You could tell he's like, yeah, Larry. And then I finally found where they injected it. I put it on of course. Hey. And, you know, uh, it's funny and kind of scary at the same time. I do not believe it's the mark of the beast because you, can know, you can't not know you're taking the mark of the beast. But I will say this. When that's your means of currency, then you can do it. And we have a credit card to stay, a banking card. Let me see what I'm doing. That's not very big, is it? A little microchip in the middle of a credit card. That's more information about me than you'll ever know. Probably more information than she knows. See what I'm saying? When you can't do anything anymore without it, the only thing I can tell you is get under his wings. Mm -hmm. When you can't buy, sell, or trade without it, what else you going to do? Get under his wings. And better yet, listen, oh Paul knew, he, he knew the gig was up, didn't he? Thing is, we don't know, do we? A lot of young people in the church right now, and it thrills my heart. And if we were looking around, I like, let's see, I wonder which one of us is next to go. Uh, you know, Junior's going to be 82 next week. <laughs> we begin counting numbers. Oh, yeah, probably him. Mathematically, that makes a lot of sense, don't it? But the thing is, we just don't know. Jarrett may be the next one. You may be the next one. You may be the next one. We just don't know. So the very best place you can be, get on the wings. Abide there. It's safe. It's mobile. It'll take you wherever, wherever you need to go. What a wonderful thing. Just abide there. But you can't do that following the world. And you can't do that if you've never if you've never tasted the goodness of Christ. <clears throat> Where are you at? What's your position this morning?